Why don't the owners just close the room? The Usador Corporation prefers to pretend there's no problem, just as they pretend there's no 13th floor. Well, this is where we part company. This is as close as I get to 1408, unless it's that time of the month. Mr. Enslin, please, don't do this. Hey guys, what's happening? Niat here with Film Comics Explained, and today we'll be taking a look at the director's cut of 1408, directed by Mikkel Hafstrom, starring John Cusack, Samuel L. Jackson, Mary McCormack, and Tony Shalhoub, based on the 1999 Stephen King short story of the same name. The film is essentially about Mike Enslin, an unhappy writer that had lost his daughter to a terminal illness, and who dedicated his life to writing non-fiction works based on the theme of haunted places, such as Ten Nights in Ten Haunted Houses, Ten Nights in Ten Haunted Graveyards, and so on, which all proved to be bestsellers. But early on in the film, Mike reveals that he had some guilt and regret with regards to his success, acknowledging that he was not a believer in the paranormal and the supernatural elements that he depicted in his writings. Driven by a desire to pair his writings with a semblance of truth, Mike dedicates his life to the pursuit of real supernatural experiences. I think it's also important to consider that since the loss of his daughter and the derailment of his marriage, the writer continuously exposed himself to these experiences, hoping to find proof of the supernatural that would enable him to speak to his daughter again, something that Mike wants above everything else. This is clearly shown in the first motel he visits, where he's visibly disappointed and almost defeated at the prospect of once again finding nothing of substance to talk about. But unfortunately for the writer, he gets far more than he bargained for when he decides to stay a night at room 1408 of the famed Dolphin Hotel in New York City, which is noted for having a number of bizarre deaths over the past 95 years, with the manager explaining that no single person had managed to survive in that room for longer than an hour. I have never used the word phantom. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh... Spirit, Spectre? No, you misunderstand. Whatever's in 1408 is nothing like that. Then what is it? It's an evil fucking room. If an English bellhop tells you don't go in that room, you think, all right, but I'm gonna go in the room. But if Sam Jackson says don't go in that room, you don't wanna go in the room. With the success of his 2003 drama, Evil, which was a deconstruction of both institutional and domestic violence and how these themes affected the perpetrators and their victims, director Mikkel was approached by Dimension Films in 2005 to direct 1408, which at that time was still in its early draft stages. After the director was brought on board, the screenplay was rewritten once again by screenwriters Scott Alexander and Larry Karaszewski. John Cusack was then cast to star as Mike Enslin the following year, before Samuel L. Jackson jumped on board as the hotel's manager a few months later. The two actors enjoyed working together so much on this project that they both ended up starring in Cell almost a decade later, which was another adaptation of Stephen King's work. In order to capture the feel of an old stylish hotel, the exterior scenes depicting the Dolphin Hotel were shot at the Roosevelt Hotel, and the interior lobby scenes were filmed at the Reform Club in London. Since the room that Mike Enslin would occupy needed to be torn down, warped, flooded, and burnt throughout the duration of the film, which would be impossible to film in a working hotel, a large set of an apartment was built at Elstree Film Studios in England that the filmmakers could tear apart to their heart's content. Yeah, but that's good. That's good moments. Is there any furniture at all in there now? Yes. It, it sinks uh, about two metres. Uh, it gimbals to 45 degrees. But there's a certain amount of calculating of the, uh, as we were saying, like the depth of the water, the approximate weight you would need to lift. The short story itself is fantastically composed, inspired by the works of Franz Kafka, who was widely seen as one of the major figures of 20th century literature. Now, Franz had a proclivity of fusing elements of realism with the fantastic and absurd, and much like King's short story, Kafka's body of work would typically feature isolated protagonists that faced bizarre and often surreal predicaments, and incomprehensible socio-bureaucratic powers with themes of alienation, existential anxiety, guilt, and absurdity, all of which were facets of the human condition that Mike Enslin would face in Room 1408.
As mentioned before, the film begins with Mike Enslin visiting a supposedly haunted motel, only to find that the stories about the location were merely just that. Stories which had been invented by the owners to counteract the steep decline in patrons they were receiving. After returning home and nearly drowning at a nearby beach, Mike receives a mysterious postcard from the Dolphin Hotel, with a message that warned him not to enter room 1408. Enslin then gives the establishment a call with the hopes of booking a night there in the interest of adding another chapter to his new book. But when he does so, he's told by the staff that the room was indefinitely unavailable, which only piqued his curiosity further. Unwilling to move on with an opportunity to experience what the room had to offer, the persistent writer notifies his publicist that he had been denied access to the room and is informed that the Dolphin Hotel was legally required to give him the room if he was a paying customer. Now, the hotel manager Gerald tries to lure Mike away from the room by offering him a free upgrade to one of the suites, but Mike forces his hand and demands entry, leading Gerald to explain that he is genuinely trying to help him. Gerald then goes on to say that while local papers had published a handful of the most gruesome deaths in the room, which increased the total number of deaths in room 1408 to 56 in the past 95 years, in fact, the management was so disturbed by the occurrences that they had formally stopped allowing guests into the room for the past 20 years. Even with this unsettling news and Gerald's offer to give the writer confidential files about each of the freak deaths that he could study and use in his book from the safety of another room, the stubborn Mike insists that he be shown the room, sealing his fate in the process. Now, while this obstinate and often mulish attitude was indicative of his personality, I also think that Mike himself had been so fed up with every previous case which had turned out to be a hoax that he genuinely wanted to find one case of the supernatural that he could document to legitimize his work. As he's been guided to the 14th floor by Gerald, the manager tells Mike that there was something that resided within the room that caused awful things to happen to its inhabitants, and he also explains that this mysterious entity also seemed to affect various electronic devices that would malfunction and operate unpredictably. Though he tries again and again in vain to make the writer reconsider his course of action, Mike refuses to let up, forcing Gerald to bring him up to the floor and hand him the key to the room. Mike then begins to make his way through the halls of the 14th floor, whilst looking at the gruesome police reports of those that had perished inside room 1408. Before he even enters the room, we get the sense that time and space are being distorted, with the writer walking past the room while distracted by the images in the folder, only to return to the very same spot he had been near the elevator. And as he approaches 1408, he sees a woman entering the nearby room with a baby, which was actually an apparition of his wife and their daughter. After entering the room, Mike begins describing the layout of 1408 in his mini cassette recorder as unimpressive and lacking in any supernatural behavior, leading the room to respond by making the clock radio suddenly start playing We've Only Just Begun by the Carpenters. <laughs> I really appreciated the work that cinematographer Benoit Del Homme put into creating a tense and uncomfortable atmosphere that was also relaying important information to the audience. For example, when Mike visits the bed and breakfast at the start of the film, the camera is still and doesn't move that much. Whereas when he first enters room 1408, the camera ceases to sit still and often sways to create this unsettling feeling as though something was not right about this place, and almost as though the room was itself moving in space and time, distorting both Mike and the audience's perception of this reality. Now Mike gets taunted several more times with the music playing randomly, the paintings moving suddenly, and he even experienced temporary deafness which distracts him into sticking his hand out the window, only to have the room close it. What's more, as he attempts to clean his wound, the water suddenly heats up to boiling temperatures, forcing Mike to concede that he actually needed medical attention. But as he calls room service, he's greeted with nonsensical statements, and though he's told that he would be transferred to the manager immediately, the line merely disconnects. These bizarre turn of events were actually a nod from Stephen King and the director to 1408's Kafkaesque inspiration, where incomprehensible socio-bureaucratic powers led to existential anxiety and feelings of guilt and paranoia. Though it seemed as though these things were actually happening to him, judging by the fact that everyone who, like Mike, had stayed in room 1408 for longer than 10 minutes had lost their minds and caused severe harm to themselves, I think it's likely that in his altered state, the writer was doing these things to himself, with Mike likely slamming the window onto his hand, just as the surgeon who'd previously occupied the room had cut his throat and attempted to stitch it back together. We even get a few clues that this was all in his head, from a crazed woman suddenly appearing behind him and proceeding to attack him, to a lamp that he threw out of his window, hoping to get the attention of those below him, only to find it disappearing into thin air. This is further supported by the family video that pops up onto his television, featuring his family before his daughter's unfortunate death. 
Though I believe the room was genuinely having some effect on Mike, after it began tormenting his mind, it was a combination of Room 1408 and Mike's unraveling insanity that led to the fervent hallucinations that continued to haunt him. There's also a disconnect between what Mike sees and what we see, indicating that he is well and truly on his way to madness. Before long, the room begins to tear itself apart and the paintings all become distorted as an indication of Mike's deteriorating mental health. As the room becomes flooded with ocean water from one of the paintings, Mike once again finds himself drowning at the beach as he had done early in the film. He then wakes up at a hospital to find his estranged wife sitting beside him. Though he tries to explain the bizarre course of events he had just experienced, Lily reassures him that he needed to rest. Both Mike and Lily then begin discussing their past and the strain that the loss of their daughter had placed on their lives. And as Mike goes into further detail about having seen his daughter in the hotel, Lily encourages him to write a book about his experience. Fueled by his Kafkaesque nightmare, which he presumed was a result of him hitting his head on his surfboard, Mike finishes the draft of his new book titled 1408 and sends it off to his publicist. Unfortunately for Mike, this too was all in his head and we see the walls around him being torn apart to reveal that he was still in room 1408. As the timer counts down to zero, Mike wakes up to find the room in pristine condition. The phone then suddenly rings and when Mike asks why they don't kill him, the voice on the other line explains that those that were there came of their own free will and that they had one of two choices, to either relive the hour over and over again in perpetual agony or to go through the express checkout, which was in essence a fancy way of saying to take their own lives. Now, he's asked whether he wanted to check out once again and he refuses, but when the entity tells him that his wife was almost there to join him, Mike sets the room alight which engulfs him in flames and destroys the evil room once and for all. The director's cut then ends with Lily attending his funeral before being approached by Gerald who had recovered a few of Mike's possessions that survived the fire. Lily tells the manager that she didn't want them and as he enters his car and plays Mike's mini cassette player, Gerald hears the voice of Mike talking to an apparition of his daughter moments before seeing the writer's burnt body in the backseat of his car. While this ending was the director's vision for the film, Mikkel had shot three other endings to the movie that included the theatrical cut which is more like the short story, with Mike and Lily getting back together. A second alternate ending which saw Mike send a transcript of his experience to his publicist before perishing in the fire, and a third alternate ending which saw Mike survive and move to LA with his wife. This movie is wonderfully crafted, especially the director's cut which manages to keep you engaged to a man in a single location, a task that is very difficult to pull off. And John Cusack is perfectly cast as a confident paranormal investigator that radiates a coolness and stubbornness that doesn't detract from his character's likability. A beautifully constructed horror film by Mikkel Hathstrom, this movie is as much about a father's inability to get over the death of his daughter as it is about a man losing his sanity under the control of a mysterious room. I also couldn't help but feel that there was something poetic about a writer who doesn't believe in spirits becoming one by the end of the narrative. This is it. Well, that's all for today, folks. Big thanks to all of you guys who requested we take a closer look at 1408. Don't forget to hit subscribe and click the notification icon to stay up to date on all my content. And if there's anything else you'd like to request, please don't hesitate to ask. As always, it's been a pleasure. Niat here with Film Comics Explained. Thanks for stopping by. Painfully dull painting is the ever-popular The Hunt. Horses, hounds, and constipated British lords. Some smartass spoke about the banality of evil. If that's true, and we're in the seventh circle of hell. Dull, gray buildings all around, honking traffic below, the view of a mortality. Oh.